distinct pleasure of introducing the second plenary speaker, uh, Elisa Celis, uh, or Celis, as I was just corrected. Uh, uh, Elisa uh, is an uh, assistant professor in the Yale's Department of Statistics and Data Science. She graduated in um, 2012 from University of Washington, and uh, after that, uh, she worked as a, um, a researcher in EPFL and also in uh, Xerox, so she had a sort of uh, industrial experience uh, as well before uh, rejoining academia uh, at Yale Department. She has won many uh, awards, uh, including uh, NSF uh, Career Award, J.P. Morgan uh, research, uh, faculty research award, and she was named one of the 100 brilliant women in, in AI ethics. Uh, really remarkable. Uh, 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 her work spans uh, uh, algorithms, algorithmic ethics, uh, fairness, uh, um, uh, and uh, using the tools from machine learning and statistics, obviously very timely and hot topic. And I, I, th I believe that today's topic is not uh, today's talk is not an exception. So it's it's uh, it's a pleasure to introduce you, uh, Elise. Uh, uh, please take it away. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you so much. It's great to be here. It's my first in-person talk in two years, so it's really nice to see a full audience. And um, yeah, I, what I'm going to be talking about today is really what I spend day and night thinking about, which is all the myriad of ways in which little aspects of the world infiltrate what we work on, all of us together as data scientists, as statisticians, as computer scientists. And it touches really all of our work in ways that even I continuously realize again and again, even as someone who's trying to address this directly. So I'm hoping that today, as I talk about this, I know many of you are familiar with the concept of, okay, data is biased, right? But I hope that we can dig in a little deeper and that you can think a little bit reflectively as you go back um, to your work, to the amazing research that you're doing and get a, get a sense of, okay, where is a place, where is a spot where I hadn't really thought about where I might not be kind of seeing the full picture, a deeper picture, and what is that saying? What is that doing to my conclusions, to my work? Um, I should say what I'm talking about today, I've had many amazing colleagues, and I'm definitely working with a large worldwide community that is dealing with these problems. So um, what I'm speaking to you today is, of course, my work, but also lots of people have contributed, and I'll try to mention their names as, as I go along. Okay, um, so really, um, kind of starting at the beginning, uh, we can think of data, and we all know that data is biased, but it's, again, there's kind of so many entry points where that can happen. And I really like uh, this quote um, by Lisa Giltman from Raw Data is an Oxymoron, which is a fantastic book. If you haven't read it, definitely take a look. Um, even just to read the introduction, it's brilliant. And what she says is that data requires our participation, right? Often we go and attack a problem and we have a big data set or something and we kind of think of that data as being there, but data is never just there. And one of the examples that she has in her book, which I think makes this really clear, is uh, kind of going back to the early days of photography. And there was, when photography emerged, it was this kind of, oh, amazing, look at this, you're capturing reality, right? This is truth. You see a photograph, what could be more like raw data than just a photograph, right? That's about as pure as it gets. You haven't processed it, you haven't done anything to it. But if you speak to any photographer, they will tell you, okay, you had to choose where to go, right? You had to choose where to point your camera, how to focus it, how to frame it. Right? There are so many decisions that go into just which photograph gets taken, or which one gets printed out, or which one gets shown. Right? So even this thing that kind of, at first glance, looks like objective, looks like reality, it's not really reality. There's, there's so much human touch that went into that. And all data is like that in one way or another. And similarly, all data science is like that in our, all way or another. Data, and I would extend this to data science, requires our participation, right? As humans, as individuals, as thinkers, um, or as, as just 
interactors with our world. And kind of to give a very cartoon version of like a data pipeline process, there's data collection. And it might be active collection, and that's a little bit easier to see where biases can emerge from active data collection. But there's also just taking data sets that are available. Now, which data sets are available and why, right? There's immense biases that can occur there. Who is in those data sets and who is not, right? Where is that representation? But even if you kind of start there and say, okay, so data is biased and we have to do something about that, sometimes we don't think about the biases that happen in our design and analysis process, right? And as any statistician will tell you, how you, how you choose what to look at and how to analyze, of course, affects what you can conclude, right? These are all, I'm not saying anything new here, I'm just trying to kind of put it all together in the same light, right? If you're reporting on, uh, say, income statistics in a country, whether you're looking at the average, right, versus the median, you will kind of get a very different feeling as to what it is that you're viewing, right? And as we go through and we start using this data to build systems, um, or to take decisions, how we analyze or how we assess how well our systems are working is also a human choice, right? What if these big companies, say Facebook or Google or Twitter or TikTok or any of, the, any of these things, what they're optimizing in some way is engagement, right? Optimizing engagement because indirectly that optimizes ad revenue. What if instead they were optimizing something else, right? What if they were optimizing benefit to their users, right? So that choice as to what you optimize, which of course has many factors at play, again will affect what you get, right? What is your algorithm doing and why is it behaving the way it is? And of course, down the line, how is that affecting users? So at each of these entry points, uh, we, we are active participants. We might not be thinking of ourselves as active participants, but we are. And at the end of the day, and really what I focus on in, in my work is, is trying to think about, okay, as these decisions are being made, as we end up biasing our processes and our data and our decisions, who is really making these decisions, right? Who is taking the decisions? And at the end of the day, who is benefiting from the decisions? And who is benefiting could be certain groups of individuals. It could be corporations versus people. It could be one country versus another. There's many different ways in which this plays out. I'm not saying there's any one fixed way. But these are just questions to think about. At the end of the day, as we run through this, what, what is the end result, right? What are we affecting? And in particular, what are we affecting that we didn't even know or think that we were affecting? And there's been an incredible amount of work over the past uh, decade or so uh, pointing out different ways in which we are affecting the world and negative ways in which we are affecting the world. Um, this, none of this is my work. This is all uh, brilliant uh, sets of people who, have, uh, who are uh, journalists, investigative journalists, who are um, doing some amazing work uncovering um, machine learning biases and how they're affecting people, and also researchers, uh, some here at MIT and at other universities around the, around the world. And what's really become apparent is that without introspecting at these different points, we can end up with negative outcomes that affect people's day-to-day -day lives. All right, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, how do I go back? Uh-oh. There's a back button. Okay. Um, so if you, uh, this amazing article by ProPublica, uh, which you might have seen, uh, called Machine Bias, they talk about how there's software that's being increasingly used in courtrooms uh, to predict recidivism, right? So someone who has been in the court system, whether or not they will recommit an offense. And the problem with this is that this information, this prediction is then shown to judges. It doesn't take a decision but it can be shown to judges to help them take decisions, right? So of course it is influencing the process and in a variety of ways, and there's been various controversies and back and forth on this, but depending on, on 
how you look at it and how you measure and what it is that you're trying to accomplish, you end up with very different outcomes in terms of who is predicted to be a recidivist and who is not. And disproportionately, it is black people who will have higher predictions for recidivism than others, even if we look at kind of similar profiles otherwise. And of course, this is, one, this is just one example, but it's one where we can immediately see the impact in which it has on people's lives. There's many other examples. Um, if you look at online ads, right, women are less likely to be shown ads for high paying jobs. Again, this is not something like someone is sitting there and trying to input this bias into the system. No one is saying that, okay, we're, as data scientists, these evil masterminds that are trying to perpetuate wrong in the world, right? That's not what's happening. What's happening is that something perfectly reasonable happened, which is, okay, let's look at um, which ads get clicked on, right? And if you look at which ads get clicked on, and use that because, okay, that shows interest, right? Maybe I'm even trying to help people or I'm trying to show them ads that are relevant to them. If you look at the context of the society that we're in, ads that are relevant to different people, depending on their background, depending on their race, depending on their gender, will be different, right? And if we follow that along, what happens is that we're just reflecting back the same inequities that are in our world, right? We're exactly trying to learn them, actually. That's what our goal of optimization is in this sense. So we're trying to learn them, and then we reflect them back in ads or in image searches or Google searches or many of the other ways in which we're constantly interacting with technology. There's many other examples. Um, I, won't walk, I won't walk through them, but I hope it's, it's kind of clear the way in which kind of doing the thing that makes sense, right? Doing the, predicting the thing that obviously we should be predicting uh, can end up with outcomes that we actually don't want as people or as a society. And I think the thing that um, really concerned me when I started working on this topic is that while I can think of this as a pipeline, it's not really a pipeline, especially in this fast-moving, well-connected world, it's really a feedback loop, right? So what happens when we reflect what is right now to people in terms of inequities of society, if we're doing that and that's changing what ads you see, what job opportunities you have, um, what, uh, how the legal system treats you, um, how the economic system treats you, um, that can end up feeding back to then the next round of data and the next round of predictions and the next round of outcomes, right? So this feedback loop can be really dangerous in a sense. But I don't want this to be kind of a, a very pessimistic message. Yes, it is very dangerous, but I think the fact that it's a feedback loop also gives me a lot of hope, right? Because what it says is that there are many places in which we can intervene, right? There's many spots where we can actually step in and say, this is, this is somewhere where I can fix this. I can't fix the whole problem, but I can help this piece, right? In my work and what I'm doing now, I can help this piece. And we can slowly tweak it, and I know that what I'm fixing right now isn't just helping me with this specific application. It's going to help everything downstream, and that's going to feed back. And hopefully over time, if collectively we all take this into account, we can make wide-scale changes. Again, not just to the technology we design, but for all the people that it impacts. Okay, so how, um, how, does, how do we make that kind of little change? Um, again, there's, there's been an increasing amount of interest in people across the world who have been working on this. Uh, one of the areas in which I specialize is in the algorithm design component. And to, again, give a very cartoonish version, what are we doing in general when we're doing quote-unquote data science? We have some data, we're trying to optimize something or maybe sample from some distribution or learn something, and we're going to give some output, okay? This is just <laughs> as simple as a pipeline as you, can, as you can have. And the type of societal biases that I'm personally 
uh, looking at. There's kind of many different ways one can define bias or fairness, but the, the types that I'm thinking about in the context of this talk, when we look at the data, really it has kind of two components, or we can think of it as splitting into two components, kind of features and labels, which could be all of it, right? But there's usually a few things that I'm gonna kind of pull out and think of as protected attributes. And those protected attributes could be uh, things like race or gender or ethnicity or religion or anything that you want to make sure that you're not using uh, to discriminate, anything that you want to make sure that you're not kind of propagating inequalities through. So these are, this is kind of what we want to check against and what those protected attributes are that might matter in a particular context will vary. Okay, so that's one, been one of the real difficulties in making progress in this area because when we start to kind of try to think about it, it's like, okay, well, what is a protected attribute? What do we want to protect against? And what exactly are we protecting and what does that mean, right? Um, and for this, I don't think that I can answer it. I don't think that we can necessarily answer it in this room. This is a broader question. Right, and this broader question is tied once we, even if we settle on what are the protected attributes, we kind of the next step that we do generally as algorithm designers in this context is to then specify what we mean by fairness constraints. So if the protected attribute is say something like race in a particular context, then I say, okay, what are fairness constraints? So the constraints say in the ProPublica case might be like, I want the rates of recidivism um, between black and not black defendants to be within 90% of each other, something like that, right? That's the, the style of fairness constraints that get talked about, but again, is that the right constraint, right? What is the right constraint? And this is a problem that I'm gonna push out for a moment, I'm gonna zoom in on this algorithmic problem for a little bit, but I'm gonna come back to that at the end. Okay, so again, we have some protected attributes, and generally what um, generally what researchers do is then they again specify something called fairness constraints. So they say, okay, this is my measure, right? They choose, this is my one specific measure of fairness, whatever I want that fairness to be called. And I'm gonna measure it according to these protected attributes. And then you can define basically a constrained optimization problem, right? So you define some constrained optimization problem often Given, uh, given all the work that's been done in this field, we know how to solve the usual problem. We may or may not know how to solve the constraint problem. So that's where the first part of the work comes in. And there might be a, what's kind of considered a computational price of fairness. Now I'm solving a more difficult problem. It's constrained, those constraints might not be nice. So I might have to pay more computationally to be able to solve this problem, but at least I have phrased it in some manner that I can solve. Once I have this kind of constrained optimization problem, if I can design some algorithm for it, I can, try to, uh, I can try to solve it in some manner, and I get an alternative output. This alternative output will satisfy whatever fairness constraints I have added, um, perhaps exactly, perhaps approximately. As you know, there are many different ways we can approach this, many different techniques we can do. I'm being purposely vague because this is, this is really kind of just a high level framework that a lot of this work falls into. And then the next thing that we look at is the difference in terms of our original metric, right? Whether that was efficiency or accuracy according to some metric or whatever it is. And this is what's called the price of fairness, right? This gap between these two, right? So really the goal is once you have framed the problem in this way, can you come up with an algorithm where you're not paying too much in terms of computation and you're not paying too much in terms of the price of fairness, right? So that's, that's kind of what the style of this work does. And there's, again, there's been a, a large community working over the past decade on such problems where the optimization problem that you're considering might vary the constraints might vary, the type of protected attributes might vary, but overall you're working on, on coming up with these new constrained optimization algorithms that allow you to solve these fairness type of problems. One of the problems with that is that every time you came up with a new fairness definition, and there are many, um, you'd have to design a new algorithm to solve your constrained optimization problem. 
right? So that was a big issue for a long time, and that was one thing that, um, when speaking to companies, was getting a lot of pushback, right? Oh, okay, but you know, next week the regulators will say this, and next week you know someone else will say that, and how can we even follow this moving ship? Uh, so one thing that we've been able to do with a series of work, which if, if you're designing, I really encourage you to check out, is kind of simplify this in terms of having a very simple framework. Because what we realized is that a lot of these fairness constraints, what they really boil down to is different functions on the ratios of the, of the protected attributes, right? So different, a function that um, takes in as input what percentage of people from different racial backgrounds, for example, and then I'll put some measure of that, right? So what we can do now is for a large class of functions that act on the input vector of protected attributes, uh, we can now have a class of optimization algorithms. So what we've been advocating for is solving this kind of meta algorithm that takes constraints on the, the entire vector. What's nice about that is often those constraints are um, a little bit simpler, so you, can, you don't have to pay too much in terms of the computational cost, and often you can prove nice bounds on the price of fairness as well. And I'm not going to go into uh, details on, on, on these, but we've been kind of using this meta framework, um, along with many of my colleagues and amazing students, um, to have these different meta optimization algorithms in a wide variety of contexts, things like online advertising, or classification, ranking, um, different kinds of voting measures, and things like that. And uh, you can see we have code and other things up um, at this website, if that would be useful. Um, so I think one of the things why I wanted to mention this, even though I don't want to get into a lot of detail, is that, again, kind of early on, a lot of the pushback was like, oh, well, that's great. Oh, we want to be fair. Oh, but you know, how, how can we do it? And there you still get a lot of rhetoric uh, around that if you listen, for example, to um, depositions of <laughs> a lot of big companies where they ask you, okay, well, why are you doing it, how are you doing it, and why are you doing it like that? But there's really, and again, not just my work, there's really a wide body of work now that says how you can change and solve these fair optimization algorithms, and there's really new things and different things that we can do if we want to do them. Um, so I don't, I, I just say that to say that there's, um, this, this field is deepening in many ways, and we can't have that as an excuse, and it's, it's just a good thing to know, so you can push back when everyone says, oh, well, I would, like, I would like that, but how, right? There's many ways how, and this is just our work, and again, there are many groups uh, that are doing similar work. One thing when doing this, so we were very happy that we had, okay, we have all these things, it's a nice framework, we're, you know, we're doing great. For, for, for a moment, I was feeling good. Um, but one thing that we click, quickly realized is that a lot of this stuff works really well when you really have kind of start with this nice, clean, in some sense, data, right? Where you have your features, you have your protected attributes, and you kind of know what's going on, right? But again, even there, in doing this work, I feel like I had kind of zoomed in on the problem and had forgotten all these different places that I mentioned at the beginning where different biases and different other um, problems can creep in, right? So what I've been focusing my work on over the past couple of years is rectifying these kind of fairness type of questions algorithmically uh, when the data that we're working with, of course it's biased, but then it has other biases on top of that or other problems on top of that. So for example, as we saw in the first talk, um, data can be strategically misrepresented, right? There, there could be various reasons why uh, someone might want to misrepresent their data if you take um, an algorithmic uh, game theory point of view. So that could be one problem. Um, there's also many ways in which our data, whether it features, yes, we know many ways to deal with noise, but when the protected attributes are noisy, that we, that's something we hadn't thought about in, in kind of the first type of framework. We kind of assumed we knew what those protected attributes were. But in many cases, those can also be noisy. It could be that you don't have all of them, so you do some imputation, and then that, that can introduce some noise, even some systematic types of noise. Um, it, could be that you, um, it could be that you're actually introducing errors 
or introducing noise, say if you're trying to be differentially private, so you're kind of tweaking with your data. So there's even good reasons to be introducing noise. But what that means is that all the nice guarantees that we had before, we no longer have. And kind of the worst case scenario, you might have completely missing protected attributes. Now you don't even know who anyone is, so what can you even do in that case? And again, you could try some kinds of imputation, but there's all kinds of problems with that as well. So what can we do in these cases? Again, kind of at first glance, it, it seems like there's, there's not much we can do, but um, we've, been, uh, we've been kind of playing with different models and there's, um, there's, more, and more, um, there's more and more things that we can do. Um, I'm going, just gonna go through kind of the first few examples quickly just to say ways in which your data can be problematic, just again as a, as a reflection point, things to think about as we're working with things um, to make sure that this is not something that we fall into, right? So there can be an adversary. Um, this is one model that we've worked with. There's an adversary that can pick some fraction of protected attributes. So here, this is kind of where the problem uh, lies in this case. And maybe they get to rewrite them arbitrarily, right? So this is one kind of model uh, which might arise uh, when there's perhaps strategic misreporting or misinformation or things like that. Um, so in these kinds of cases, um, you can again kind of go back to that initial framework and now it's just being very delicate and careful with the type of constraints that you place and the type of guarantees uh, that you're allowed to give. Uh, so you can do that. You can kind of push this back to those original frameworks. We've worked this out fully for classification, although I'm hopeful it also works for some of the other areas um, to show how you, how you can handle that. Um, similarly for, say, noisy cases uh, where you might have some protected attributes that end up uh, flipping, right? Um, again, for a lot of these examples, sorry, for a lot of these pictures, I should say, uh, I'm using um, as the protected attribute here, I'm just using uh, male or female. Of course, this is an oversimplification uh, using binary gender. It's a simplification that unfortunately is pervasive, right, in this field. Um, so this is one thing, um, this is another thing that even in this type of slide and this type of work, there's more to do, there's more layers to appeal, there's more ways in which even the work that we're doing to debias has ingrained biases, right? So I just want to acknowledge that as well and say that this is, this is something that um, we have to keep working on and even us as researchers who are working on this area have to keep working on, right? Um, when we're looking at noise, this is kind of noisy things where we flip, um, so for each data point, the protected label might change with some probability. Um, this, is a, a, this again appears all the time. It uh, might be just random recording errors, might be due to differential privacy. Um, and in these cases, again, we can kind of, we've, we've shown how you can uh, use that original framework for fair classification, um, being a little bit more careful with your constraints and your analysis. One, one area uh, which I think is really important to, to think about is when we have implicit biases. And this is kind of going, uh, moving away from the protected attribute problems, but problems in the features or labels. And this is, um, when we have implicit biases, we, we might think that we have accurate measures of, say, work performance, right? But there's just immense evidence uh, from sociology, from other fields, as to how these supposedly objective measures of human performance are systematically biased, um, whether it's uh, according to gender, according to race, according to a myriad of reasons. So again, kind of going back and saying, okay, we were kind of assuming we had some notion of true features, right? But of course, nothing is true, right? So where can we actually detect systematic biases? And when we do detect them, how can we go ahead and go in and, and change our algorithm to take these into account, right? And the nice thing about all of these things that I'm, that I'm telling you is that, yes, initially I kind of framed it as, a, as when you fix this, you then also have a price of fairness, right? You have some cost according to that original measure. But the original measure if you go back and think about it, it's already flawed. It might not be what you're even trying to optimize, or it is, it might be what you're trying to optimize, but it's optimizing using false data, 
right? So your output, even though it's quote unquote optimal according to the information you have, if the information you have is wrong, then that's not even a good measure. And I think that's illustrated, this appears actually in all of these cases, but I think that's illustrated particularly nicely in this case of implicit bias. When you have implicit bias, if you say, for example, all female candidates in their performance reviews are, and it doesn't have to be exact, it can be an expectation or are, are downgraded some points, right? Um, here we had a multiplicative model of bias. But in this toy example, say, say that's, that's what's happening, and you want to select the best team for your organization. Now, if you select the best team using the quote unquote true features, the raw features that, oh sorry, the, the raw features that you see, what you're going to get is a subset that is not actually your optimal subset, right? If you say, I want the best people on my team, well, best, but you used a measure that was faulty, right? So when you go in and you, and you adjust what you're doing, keeping in mind these biases, and you can adjust for things like implicit bias, um, then the end output, yes, there is a price of fairness compared to your observed features, but you actually improve according to the true underlying features, right? Which might not be observable uh, up front, but down the line you can see. Right, so, the, so what happens is in kind of digging this out, and this is, again, this is just kind of the, the most obvious one, but this happens across the board. There's been so many places where I've seen where, okay, we do something and we prove something, and yes, we can bound the, the price of fairness, and then we run some experiments, and our constrained algorithm is, does better <laughs> according to the original objective, because it's, it's peeling back those layers and it's getting to some deeper truth and it actually is, ends up doing better what we wanted to set out to do initially. But when we're setting out to do something initially with some blinders on, even if we don't know those blinders are there, that constrains us in other ways and we're actually not able to, um, to do as good a job as we could if we were to dig deeper and uncover some of these biases and try to rectify them. Okay, I have 10 minutes. I'm gonna try to give you at least a little bit of details on one of these problems. And I like this problem because when I first started talking about this um, with my student, this was, okay, what if we don't know what the protected attributes are at all, <laughs> right? The first reaction was like, well, then there's nothing we can do, right? There's really, we're, we're kind of lost here, right? If we don't know anything about who people are, there's nothing we can do. Um, and unfortunately, this happens a lot. Right, so this could be with um, data that, um, that we scrape from the internet. So for example, image search, right? So that's one of the, one of the examples that, it, um, that is classically biased. If you search for CEO, you get predominantly male faces on image search, even more so than uh, ground truth, say for the US. Um, but these images, right, even if I wanted to apply any of these nice algorithms that we have, they don't, have, they don't come to me labeled. Right? And I could label them, but then that comes with other problems in terms of uh, imputation errors that can then propagate in, in weird and destructive ways. Um, so what we, what kind of our question, our first line question was, okay, well, what can we do? If we don't want to use, if we don't want to kind of learn or guess what these labels are, is there anything that we can do at all? And somewhat surprisingly, there, there is. And kind of going back to this, this image example, right? So if we search CEO, um, what, what we can do here, what we're trying to do is uh, measure the diversity and representation, right? So if we knew, for example, what the gender was of the person reflected in this image, and again, this is hugely oversimplifying um, because people may or may not present as, the, as their gender, but, uh, Okay, given these oversimplifications for now, if we knew, then maybe we could do some auditing, right? We could measure the disparity in what we're seeing, and maybe we can use that either to audit data sets, audit underlying data sets, or to do some kind of auditing of the output of systems overall. Um, but we don't know, uh, we, we don't know what, uh, what those true labels are. Uh, they're just not given to us in the metadata, right? So, the, so what we want to do is, 
um, for this particular work that I'm talking about, which appeared in KDD last year, was say, okay, how can we measure these kinds of disparities without these type of attribute labels? Again, with the idea of auditing some kind of auditing mechanism in mind, either auditing of a data set or auditing of an output. And as I said, this kind of appears, and this has been shown many, many times, appears in image search all the time. Okay, so of course we don't want to either hand label or crowd annotate um, because we can't crowd annotate the entire internet and that would be expensive. Um, we can predict potentially some attributes using some pre-trained prediction models, um, but that's been shown um, by other researchers that it can affect the diversity audit in, in some unpredictable ways. Um, so it's, it's not ideal if that's what we're trying to do. Um, so what we want to do is audit um, in the absence of those attribute labels entirely. Uh, so what we do is something really quite simple. Um, we, if we have um, kind of our data set and we have our, our protected attributes, whatever they are, uh, and what we want is this disparity, uh, this disparity measure, what we do is we first collect uh, what, what we call a control set, which is just a representative example. If we're thinking about images, and I think of collecting a set of images, 30 images, 50 images, something that you can do as a human, that you say, if I look at this set of images, um, this is diverse according to whatever my, my notion of diversity is, right? my desired notion of diversity is. Okay, and for this little control set, I know what, um, what the protected attributes are, um, and they're balanced in whatever way, again, um, that I want for my particular application, right? So it's kind of really a small image set. Uh, if you're thinking about uh, uh, kind of uh, portray gender, kind of visibly, uh, what, what does it look like? Maybe roughly equal numbers of men and women. So now what we're going to do is use this tiny control set to try to get an assessment of what the diversity is um, the disparity measure is of the set overall, or again, of the output of whatever algorithm I have. Um, now, of course, we can't use any representative set. Um, this, we want it to be appropriate for the given, given setting, um, so it, it has to be domain relevant and things like that, but um, in general, you can think of if we're assessing, again, keep this example in mind. You have uh, images of people and you have just your little hand curated um, 30 image set. So what we really want to do is kind of quantify in some way the similarity between this wider data set and our control set in this diversity metric. And what we can do is we can use a, a similarity metric. There's different ones you could use for a variety of reasons, um, but let's, um, let's just say modified cosine distance or whatever your favorite similarity metric is. And if we have our data set and we have, this is our control set, which is currently split into um, say two, two different labels for a protected attribute. Um, what we're doing is we can just kind of look at the average similarity between the data set and each of these different groups, right? And I can say, okay, well, let's look then at the disparity between these two similarities. Now that's not exactly the same and you might already see that, okay, this can be a bad approximation to our original disparity metric because whatever similarity score we have uh, will capture some baseline similarity as well and that will all get folded in, um, but that we can kind of fix by doing some pre-processing and renormalizing across these similarity metrics. Um, so I just changed this slightly to do some normalization in terms of the similarity. And this, what's surprising is that this really simple process where we do this just basic similarity ends up giving us a decent approximation to the disparity metric. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm running out of time, so I won't talk through that. Um, but what, what we see is surprisingly, again, kind of just being able to say, okay, visibly, this is what I mean by diversity. If we test this out in some settings, actually, it, it works remarkably really well. So I didn't have to know anything. I didn't have to label anyone. I didn't have to uh, know these ahead of time or crowdsource them. I can just use some image similarity, and we've done this in other domains for text similarity as well. Um, and you can already get some kind of measure, some kind of audit 
of what your data is looking at. And what this does is it makes it much easier and much, much computationally easier and also conceptually easy um, to go ahead and audit different data sets for whatever uh, disparities you think might be in there. Now I should say this kind of simple hand curating or even random, uh, randomly selecting, which is what we did for this experiment, works well in some settings. It doesn't work well in others. Here what we, uh, what we used was this PPB um, data set um, and it has uh, gender and skin tone. So these were the kind of protected attributes that we could use. For gender, it worked really well. For skin tone, these basic ones didn't. For that, basically, we need better control sets. So there's different, oh, uh oh. We need different control sets. So we need to find better algorithms for finding those control sets, and that's some work, uh, some ongoing work we have where we have different kind of adaptive ways to, uh, to do that. But there's, there's certainly an open question there. And here, it really starts getting into uh, intersectional concerns and how, how do you manage to um, make sure that uh, the people who are most marginalized and most underrepresented in our data, uh, we're still capturing, um, we're still making sure that uh, we can reflect them uh, in the output of our algorithms and our data sets and can recognize when they are not there. Okay, so this you can do for auditing. You can also take this very simple idea and you can do it for subset selection. Um, we've done it for images, so kind of this is our CEO image pre-algorithm and post-algorithm, we get something very different. Um, so it's kind of these, I guess the, the high level idea is here that sometimes it can be really simple tweaks. It can be really simple tweaks that can make a big difference in what the overall output of your algorithm is. And I'm really out of time, so I'm kind of rushing through this, but I want to get to this slide, which is that I think, um, and I love this image, that together we lift the sky, I think that really, we, we have a unique set of skills uh, that can really make an impact. And actually, they are making an impact whether we want it to or not, right? So as we design algorithms, as we put them out into the world, as companies use them, whether we want to or not, they're impacting our world, right? Whether we think about how they're affecting people or how they're not affecting people, whether we think about biases that they're propagating or not, they will do that, right? So it's just kind of really a call to everybody um, to really think about what are we paying attention to, who are we affecting, either directly or indirectly, and what can we do um, to make sure that we're moving this trajectory, this feedback loop in a positive direction. Um, I did say that this is kind of, for a lot of this talk I really zoomed in. Right? And I just looked at this algorithms and okay, what can we tweak here and what can we tweak there? Uh, this is really situated in a much broader space. Um, here I mentioned policies and regulations, but really um, our sociologist friends, our historian friends, our philosophy friends, we need everybody to work together with us because again, this is one zoomed in piece. What the right fairness definition is in what context, what protected attributes in what context, or when do we act actually need to step away and say actually any algorithm in this context is doing more harm than good and doing something else, right? These are all questions that we need to be having collectively um, amongst each other's researchers and amongst the wider community as well. And I really want us to kind of look together and see, okay, who is really leading data science? Who will lead data science into the future and who will it serve? Because really I think these are the underlying questions uh, that we're saying here. And kind of as a last point, I wanna say data is not what things are, right? And it's certainly not what things must be. I, I, I think there's a lot of hope for the future, and I think that we have a great opportunity to help build that future together towards justice and towards good for everybody. All right, thank you. information on whether reward or penalty works better for rectifying data? Um, in what sense? Well, uh, in terms of motivating actors? To motiv motivate people. Uh, that's a great question. Um, it's, it's unclear. I think they all help move the needle. They all help nudge. Um, but I think it really depends on the, on the context. 
right? Um, I think often, uh, just from the psychological literature, if it's for individuals, reward, kind of having some positive feeling that comes with it, does more than fear. But if you're looking at companies, um, I think there's growing belief that regulation and penalty is important. But again, this is wide open debate. So I don't think there's a clear answer on how to get either people or companies to, to move in this direction. Thank you. Yes, it definitely does depend on the size of the control set. And part of it was for, uh, for skin tone, we had six different classes um, in that uh, case. And for gender, we had two. So indeed, if you grow the size of the control set uh, to, say, 100 instead of 30, you, you get much better variance. Um, but also, you can start doing more sophisticated things. There's um, kind of ways to adaptively um, kind of do a hybrid human computer adaptive control set. And uh, that helps you basically distinguish so you have more kind of unique points, if that makes sense, and uh, unique points in the feature space as opposed to the kind of human diversity space. So kind of combining those two helps you reduce the variance in a lot of these cases. Thank you. Thank you so much.